tone chaser. That thing you hear in your head that you just can't quite get. You read a mine? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, after about four hours of, uh, of working on this thing, <laughs> uh, we looked at it and said, hey, it looks pretty good. Good job, Mike. I'm going to split now, okay? I said, wait a minute. I looked at it again. Instead of barnacle bills, it said barnacle bills. <laughs> <laughs> we had misspelled it. <laughs> so back to the drawing board. It's a minor thing, but it's just funny because look on Mike's face. It was, it was priceless. He's going, oh, fuck. Before the Starwood gig, though, um, Gene Simmons had somehow heard of the band and had done a demo. He came by the Starwood. We were playing, and again, it's funny, it's, it's almost ironic that they, they came on one of the, the slowest nights. Uh, Simmons, at one point, uh, just decided that he wasn't going to be able to spit blood and jump around and do what he does for a living, and he wanted to eventually become producer. Uh -huh. So he says, I'll tell you what, I'll play producer, you guys be the band. We'll go to New York, and we'll just uh, record. And that's what we did. How did he hear about the band? How did he know about that album? Yeah, I think it was already in the, in the papers, you know, mm -hmm. the, in the, uh, uh, the fan magazines, where always they, they have the, the new upcoming mm -hmm. band, the so-and-so, mm -hmm. the so-and-so. Mm -hmm. so and, -so. Mm -hmm. and again, like I said, you can't argue with uh, a band drawing 5,000 people mm -hmm. to uh, a gig without having a record label or a record. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. there so, are no secrets in this business. When Gene came by, I mean, was the band impressed? Was Edward saying, wow, that guy from, I mean, was it? We were interested. Yeah. He was very upfront and very honest, and he told us what he wanted to do, and we felt it was, uh, it would be good to go and try it. I heard that a name that he was singing, I, th I heard that he didn't like the name Van Halen. But he thought it sounded like Van Heusen or something. Yeah. Well, what he wanted, he, just as a joke, he wanted to call it uh, the band Virus or something like that. Virus. I heard they wanted to call it Daddy Long Legs. That was the name we went under when we recorded in, uh, in New York. It is. Yeah. Daddy Long Legs, when we went to, uh, what's it, that old studio? Uh, the one where uh, Hendrix used to record all the stuff. Electric Ladyland? That's it. Is that where you went really? Yeah. Did he engineer too? I think he had a hand in everything. I'll tell you, uh, Gene Simmons is a, a very interesting person. Mm -hmm. He's, he, uh, he likes to be in every aspect of what's going on. He was checking out uh, the producing type. Uh... Yeah, I knew I shouldn't have drank that whiskey. Really? Listen. No, I'm kidding. No, don't worry about it. And you tell you just you just <clears throat> say the word and we no, continue. Okay. Gene, Gene was uh, he was really cool. I think if anybody taught us anything, it was him, as far as uh, how to work in a studio and how to be relaxed and how to play. And it made us much more comfortable when we actually made our own record. And in the same token, he uh, got to learn uh, a lot more about turning knobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the band's real first major experience in the studio then, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Did Edward, I mean, did Edward say anything about being there? Or, I mean, was... Well, I'll tell his... you, we were, we were basically just kind of bowled over. This all came as, as a, a shock. I mean, here is uh, an established uh, musician, you know, Gene Simmons, coming over asking us and he paid for our flight he paid for our hotels he, he paid did. for everything he paid for the studio time the whole thing and uh, it just really it knocked us out as far as I was impressed hmm. let's put it that way how much before you actually got signed to Warner's did this happen a year a year hmm. so what happened uh with the demo and what, 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 what transpired? Well, there was basically an under, underground uh, radio station, which was uh, K-Rock, K-R-O-Q, with uh, Bingenheimer mm -hmm. being the, uh, the DJ. And he would play anything that he, <laughs> that he fancied. 
Mm -hmm. If you wanted to hear the sound of tires running around, fine. You would sit there and he'd pop on a tape of tires and screeching. And um, somehow he got a hold of the uh, the original demo that we did with Simmons, and he played it. And that was it. Huh. So I mean, no more. I I heard that Bill Coin didn't really like the band. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He, no, he didn't. Uh, to sit there and have his shoes polished while he's sitting there talking business just so he looks cool with mm -hmm. his three-piece suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were we were uh, four nobodies and we didn't know what the fuck was going on. I think the only person who really cared about us was Simmons. Mm -hmm. And when we walked into the office and here this guy sitting there with his fucking little cigar and his little pinstripe mustache and his feet being polished sitting there telling us, no, I can't take you on, and that kind of crap. I said, fuck you. Hmm. I heard they said a band called Piper instead of, you know. Oh, yeah. That was, that was with, uh... Billy Squire. Billy Squire, man. And I, I just hope you do. I mean, it's... I think uh, the book should be in-depth, and I'll tell you. Um, I just want your, and this sounds stupid, I just want, I want you to love what it is, and I want Edward to love what it is, and if you guys well, love it... Well, I'm a bit bitter, let's put it that way. And I, I, I guess a lot of people can be bitter about whatever, their job, their fucking mother, their mother-in-law, their wife, whatever. Uh, looking back on the whole thing, it was just that, uh, well, a particular incident uh, with... Uh, What's his name? Bill Coin. Yeah, with Bill Coin, was that we were impressed. I mean, here we are, little L.A. kids, uh, trying to impress people by the clothes we were, et cetera, and walking into his fancy office and seeing this guy sitting there polishing his shoes or having somebody polish his shoes. Uh, had it been today, it'd be a little bit different. I'd say, Bill. You lick my fucking bottom of my shoe, you a cocksucker. Actually, didn't Edward even, didn't months later, in the band, well, I guess it must have been, you know, a year later after the band had been signed, um, and they started doing something, didn't Bill call up Edward and say, listen, I'd like to manage you guys? Did something like that, that transpire? No, that I don't know. I don't yeah, know. It meant something like that to me. So basically, nothing happened then with that? No. It was a trip to New York, so he came back. I mean, what were the feelings? Was it like, oh, shit? Or was no, that... it was uh, it was excitement. Uh, we really looked up to uh, to Simmons because he was at a stature. Would with... see, you have to remember that uh, at that time we were young kids. I mean, we really were kids. We were in our late teens, and the whole thing of fancy building, fancy studio, fancy knobs, fancy lights, the whole thing. So all of a sudden, Jesus Christ, you're bombarded by all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really didn't pay attention to what the hell was going on. And uh, Simmons tried to teach us a few things. Uh, as a matter of fact, before we signed the thing with Warner Brothers, the contract with Warner Brothers, we even read a book called Star Making Machinery mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't make the same mistakes that somebody else had made. Mm -hmm. Well, I read the book, so would everybody else, and we still made the same mistakes. <laughs> 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 but you, you know, when, when you're 32 years old, uh, you tend to have a different, a different outlook. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I'm sorry about is, or sad about, is that I wish I had the energy of the 16-year-old body that I had yeah. when I was 16, mm -hmm. and the smarts. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I'm slowing down any. Yeah. But I'll tell you, it does take me a few minutes longer to get out of bed these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you came back to L.A. You planned to start with the whiskey, so you're still working. Yeah. To plan this just, song on the we radio. Did the same the thing. Demo. I hate to make it sound so mundane, but that's that's basically what it was. We just came back and we played and we played and we played and we played, and our basic philosophy was just to to uh, have as many people listen to the music, and well, whammo, home run. Mo Austin and Ted Templeman right. show up. Marshall Burl is managing the band at this time? He was managing after we signed the contract with Warner Brothers. After you signed, so you really had no man... I heard that Alan Silvers, is that the right name? Yeah. Who is Alan? Alan Silver. Alan oh, Silver. He's an ice cream salesman or something, Exactly. He, right? Well, he's, uh, 
<laughs> okay, I know I'm going to get shit for this. But <laughs> Alan Silver is a an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, very low level, but yet an entrepreneur. The guy knows how to turn a buck into a buck. And uh, he impressed us with his... Uh, his imitation, uh, what's that fucking car called, uh, with the pipes coming out the side? Um, anyway, he had a fancy car. Excalibur. You know, yeah, Excalibur, that's it. And he impressed us. I mean, you know, when you're driving a fucking 59 Opal, <laughs> and you can barely <laughs> scrape enough money to buy a gallon of gas, Is that uh, what a car you like that impresses you. What? Is that what you were driving? Yeah, well, I was driving a 70, I think. No, it was 70. 68. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, Alan uh, was uh, a very, well, he's a hustler, how's that? Mm -hmm. He knows how to turn a buck into a buck, and he wanted to be our manager. But uh, after talking to him, we realized that the guy knew absolutely nothing about the music business. Mm -hmm. He was good at uh, hustling but not good at knowing what the music business is all about. Mm -hmm. And I hate to make it sound like this, but the music business is a business. And it's, it's too bad that uh, so many artists get wrapped up or end up being racked up by these people in the business. Because all these guys at the top see, all these guys at the top see is dollars. Okay, now take a look at me and pretend that I'm 56 years old. I know nothing about music. I wear a suit and a tie. I have the prestigious uh, job of being one of the presidents of a certain company. What do you do? You sit there and you finagle and you work on getting the best deal out of any artist. You get a band walking in, say in the music business, Okay, you look down the roster and you say, okay, this is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so, and this is Bill, and this is Bob. Hey, Bill, how you doing? I'm being congenial. You come on in and just be my friend. No problem. This company's going to do everything for you. Yeah. yeah. They'll do it as long as it makes money for them. <laughs> so Alan Silvers was passed on then. Nothing was ever signed with Alan. him. Alan. Alan. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you didn't sign anything with him. Oh, no, no. He, he was... No. You're, you're at the Starwood. The band is signed to Warner Brothers Records. Right. Can you talk at all about what kind of a deal you guys had? The worst. Uh, Can you talk... We signed... What happened was, again, we were just babes in the woods. Mm -hmm. We knew nothing about nothing. So we had the services of a attorney, and his name will remain nameless okay. because I don't want to slander him in public. Yeah, that'd be too heavy. Yeah. Uh, the guy cut the worst deal for us that you can ever imagine. I won't even get into the figures, but I'm telling you, I can guarantee you it was the worst. And it took uh, five other attorneys, one at a time, who we each individually fired later on down the line, to finally get the thing sitting down properly. And it's a shame, because the first record sold a lot, the second one sold a lot. After two years of touring, 11 months a year, plus having two platinum albums, we owed Warner Brothers close to $2 million. You told me you, told me you, you owed them a million dollars in the first two years. A million dollars to 70, 80 million dollars. Yeah, so it's a total of two million. Okay, anyway, we paid that back in the second record. I, I don't know the exact finances, but let's put mm -hmm. it this way. We didn't make any money. You really did, you really had, like, you were, had no more money than you did playing at the Starwood or things like that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Was it a bit dis disheartening? I mean, do you think, God, we had made it, and it's like, where is it? Uh, no, because we always kept our, um, our sights high and knew that we had more music. And, again, like I say, it's just, it's, un it's I can't explain it. It's something in the blood. We're musicians, we want to play, and there is no other rush that you can get than playing in front of a live audience and playing to your best of your capability. Uh, the money is nice, but I tell you, it hasn't changed my life at all. I'm not going to tell you how many millions I made last year, 
but do I look any different now than I did when <laughs> that one time I was with you over your house? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't mean shit. How did Edward feel after the band was signed? I mean, he must have been pleased. I don't know. I never, I never, I was never really that conscious. super, con yeah, conscious or super close to Ed. Ed and I would, we'd sit together and watch TV. We'd sit together and listen to, uh, to records. But when I would go out to see a girlfriend or something, Ed would sit there in the bedroom his little cubicle bedroom and play guitar. Really? So it was, sometimes I was detached from him and it, I think uh, it was good in a certain way because you can't be with somebody for 24 hours a day because mm -hmm. it, uh, it gets rather you know, bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ed, he, he, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Ed and I used to beat the shit out of each other. And I mean physically beat the shit out of each other. Yeah. People would not even try to break, to break the fight up. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? Ask Ed. They would not even come so close. This is when you as were to try to. Yeah, about 18. 18. Nobody would come close enough to even try to break it up because we would get in some violent uh, altercations. <laughs> but the funny thing was, is neither one of us ever really tried to hurt the other. Mm -hmm. It just looked mm -hmm. like we were violent. Right. Like I would take that and I'd throw him against the wall, and they'd be going, and he would see stars, and, <laughs> and then he would sit there and he'd kick me a couple times and beat the shit out of my yeah. face. But he yeah. would never really lay into it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think, uh, I think in all, all of the fights, none of us either never uh, drew blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't like it was kill time. It was just. Uh, Ed and I are very headstrong, and when we come to a disagreement, uh, usually we can we can say, okay, well, we'll do this and we'll do that, but, but sometimes when it doesn't, and when you're in the middle of a take, or you're in the middle of playing, and Ed tells me that I'm rushing, or that I'm slowing, and I tell him that he's playing out of tune, <laughs> whatever, uh, you sit there, fucking throw the goddamn guitar down, get your fucking ass over here, motherfucker, I will beat on you! <laughs> And like I said, neither one of us has ever drawn blood from the other. So it's just uh, getting the, uh, the thing out. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, right. So let's talk about your parents during this period. I mean, say when, when the band started playing Strywood and the Whiskey, were, were your parents more uh, um, supportive? No, less. <laughs> Seriously? Mm -hmm. Like I said, just the very word, at that time, the very word of uh, Hollywood made everybody just say, oh my God, you're going out with those faggots? Really? That type of routine. That's how your parents saw it? Not only my parents, uh, everybody who, uh, who I grew up with. I grew up with a bunch of kids in, uh, in Pasadena. Who's, uh, Pasadena is basically a middle America type town where everybody likes to play baseball and um, you drink beer and on Saturday nights you sit there and beat the shit out of each other, right? Mm -hmm. Have you had too many beers? When you go to Hollywood and you've got people wearing spandex and uh, high heeled shoes and uh, makeup and mm -hmm. that kind of thing, so you go, my God, you're playing in Hollywood? What kind of shit? Until they all started to go out there, and then they started wearing all this <laughs> and to the rest of the crap, and they started to realize that uh, that, that was really uh, just something to do. You know, people doing things out of boredom. Mm -hmm. So your parents really were saying, Alex Edward, don't go to school. Go to school. That was basically it. Did you? Did? I said basically again. <laughs> um. What, what, what kind of work was your dad doing at this point? I mean, around the... Music, and uh, for a daytime job, he was just doing menial stuff, like uh, he was a, uh, a machinist. Machinist. Yeah. So he was being, he was able to play his music now? Oh, yeah. Playing. Oh, he played uh, four to five nights a week. He was like in bands and... Yeah, oh, yeah. What were hotels or restaurants? Anything. Or? You name it. It was uh, a very... Uh, you couldn't set, you, you wouldn't know what kind of job you would have the next week. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he would play at the at the the Hilton, or he would play at a certain club, or he would play 
just anywhere, a wedding, you know, somebody pops you a hundred bucks and you say, hey, I'll play the wedding. So was, was he happy? Uh, yeah, he had a great time, and I had a great time with him. Uh, it's funny, you know, when I first got into this thing, I felt like a kid thrown out in, into the fire, so to speak. But uh, my dad taught me all about the stuff, and, and I, I started to learn how, human, how humans react. I'll never forget, we were playing a wedding, and it was one of those uh, cheesy weddings where as opposed to where you get your drink and your so-and-so and your so-and-so or whatever. Uh, what they did was, about five feet apart, every section where people would sit on the long tables, mm -hmm. there were about five tables, and every five feet there was a bottle of vodka and a bottle of, sh of uh, champagne and a bottle of whiskey. So my dad says, hey, Al, go run out to the car and get your drum case. I said, well, Pa, the, the, the drums are already out of the cases. He said, just shut up and go to the car and get your drum case. And I said, okay, which one? He said, the big one. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I said, okay, you know, he's my father. <laughs> I can't say no, <laughs> otherwise he'll flatten me. He's that motherfucker, he's one strong son of a bitch. <laughs> so I said, now, okay, I got the drum case. I said, what do you want for this? He says, you see all those bottles on those tables? <laughs> I said, yeah. He says, put them in the case. <laughs> We took almost, I, I swear, yeah, we took about a hundred pounds Did you know of, uh, of all the booze <laughs> that was there. Oh, we had a great time driving home, too. I bet. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of guy he was. So you, you, were, you were playing with your dad then? Yeah. More, I mean. Oh, yeah. No, I played with him a lot. You did? Uh, as of age 18, uh, I started playing with him all the time. Really? I, I worked 20 hours a day. What I did was I had a, a, a job at a machine shop, which lasted from 6 in the morning to 6 at night. Then I would run home, or not run home, drive home, change my clothes because I smelled like oil and all that fucking crap. And then um, I would uh, I would go out with my dad and play. See his finger? Yeah, tell me the story. I want to hear that machine shop story. Before we get to that, though, you were still you're playing with Van Halen at this point, right? No, this is before Van Halen. You're eight, oh, it's before. Okay. You still, you, you just got out of high school? Yeah. You're this is just me and Ed with any bass player we can find and any singer we can find. So this is like the um, uh, Genesis period? Bald? I think it was a Genesis, yeah. Yeah, around there. Okay, right. I'm sorry. So so you're, uh, you're working at your machine shop, the same machine shop that your dad worked at? Yeah, well, he worked at 10 years prior. Yeah, Jesus. You want to hear a funny story? Yeah. Is this the finger story? No. I want to hear that one, too. Okay, well, this is, this is the pot story. Okay. My dad used to work in a place called Screwmatic. Screwmatic? Screwmatic. And it was for, uh, I think, about a dollar thirty-five an hour. Really? Something like that. It was really cheesy pay. How long had you been out here now? Uh, about two weeks. Oh, you just moved. You just yeah, I just moved oh, in, right. and my father couldn't speak a fucking word of, Eng word of English, okay. and the Mexicans couldn't speak a word of English either. So <laughs> they were on even ground. Right. Okay. Uh, he used to work the swing shift, which was I think from six in the evening to about two in the morning. He didn't have a ride home, so he asked one of the Mexican guys to give him a ride home. They get in the car. The guy has a burnt out tail light. Cop comes right behind him, pulls him over, and the guy freaks out, so he slams on the brakes. My father is sitting there with a thing, a little container, a little baggie, rather, of what's called vanilla shack, which is tobacco. You roll it yourself. Well, when the guy slammed on the brakes, <laughs> the tobacco went whoop, <laughs> and it went all over the place. So the cops come in, and they sit there, and they look at everybody, and they thought my dad was smoking pot. Now, in those days, which I think was about 1962, just a word marijuana, if you say it, it will get you deported. So they yanked my dad out of the car, threw him in the can, because they thought he was smoking pot. And he was in the, uh, in the glass house over there at uh, L.A. Central, uh, in the county. Uh, well, he was there for one day, and he was there for two days. Uh, and he was there for three days. 
he was there for four days. Oh my god! He was there for five days. Oh no. Then he was there for six days. Then he was there for seven days. And then he was there for nine days and eight days and ten days. And we finally called uh, my aunt, who was the one who sponsored us to come over to this country. And we said, you must. Yeah. We said, you know, uh, we haven't seen uh, Jan for quite a while. <laughs> uh, do you know where the hell he's at? I mean, we know he's in jail, but when is he getting out? She says, oh, you don't know? You can bail him out. We said, bail? What's that? Oh, my God. See, in Holland, in those days, I don't know if it's still the same, if you infract, uh, you know, infraction against the law, if you run over a cop, for instance, like my dad had done before. In Holland? Well, he was drunk one night, and he was riding his bicycle. Oh. He said he saw two cops, so he wanted to go between them. Well, it was only one. <laughs> so he ran the guy over. So the automatic had threw him in the can for about three days. And after that, they let you out. Well, we never heard of a thing such as bail. Mm -hmm. So we finally bailed him out. He was in the glass house for ten days. God. The, guy, the guy doesn't know how to speak English. He said, oh, man, they spray stuff all over you. They de-lice you and all that kind of crap. Oh, shit. So anyway, to make a long story short, he finally got off the whole thing. And uh, because they, they, they saw tobacco um, and whatever else. Uh, and so it wasn't pot. Anyway, these same guys who employed him at that time, later on employed me at a different plant. So I was working there. And I was working on a magnetic table. All I had to do was take a part. It was about the size of a bullet. And you put it on a magnetic table, slide it against the thing, and you push the button and it goes... And it files it down. whoop de do. You know, you got to do that for fucking 10 hours a day. Jesus Christ. So I'm sitting there, and I'm just checking out to see how strong the magnet is. <laughs> well, the magnet wasn't so strong, because all of a sudden, the bullet, or the thing, that looked like a bullet, went boot, and my finger went boot. And that's the remains of it. So they, they put it back together, they slipped it back on. And it actually cut the whole finger off? Yeah. It was on the ground or something? No, the skin. It was from here to here. The skin was off. I could see the bone. And it was just hanging there. And I'm looking at it. And I'm going into shock. <laughs> I mean, you know, I like to think of myself as some kind of a tough guy. But I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't care. Uh, I couldn't out-tough this one. So this is the first notice. finger on your left hand. Yeah. yeah. If you see, see the different skin tone oh, yeah. and the rest of the shit. Oh, yeah. The whole thing was just shredded. <laughs> and then I went to the hospital. And I sit there and I got the thing. And they slide it back on, and then they sewed it back on. And isn't this that you never told your dad or something because your favorite was going to hit you or something? Yeah, I thought he was going to kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, I come home. I come home, and I got this big bandage, and I sit there, and I stuck it behind my back. And I said, oh, hi, Pop. <laughs> What's happening? Didn't you tell Edward not to say something? Yeah. I felt, I'll tell you what, I felt very embarrassed. And uh, the thing that, uh, again, had had this happened now, I'd be a lot smarter. I could have sued that, that place for everything they owned yeah. because it was their fault. They didn't have the guard on the machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what allowed my finger to go through it. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, I, I was scared shitless, man. This little whap. And here's my finger. I go, hey, hey, come back here. Come back here. Yeah. Was Edward working during this period? Did he have a job? No, I was making music. Ed used to drive me to uh, work. <laughs> well, he'd get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and he'd take me down there and we'd have coffee and some cigarettes and uh, then he'd come and pick me up uh, at the end of the work day. So he'd stay at home and practice his guitar all day? Yeah. Huh. Ed has always practiced his guitar all day, hasn't he? I wouldn't call it practicing. I, I think he has such a love for the instrument that uh, he's just playing. I don't think I've ever seen Ed without uh, a guitar. So he would be home with your mom during the day? I think he'd be home by himself. Hey, you know, my mom was there, but it wasn't like they were sitting together, you know what I mean? Right. No, Ed would just play, and he'd listen, and he'd pick up different things from, uh, from different people. But I've never seen anybody with uh, the conviction and just the love for the instrument. I've never seen him without a guitar. And it, it just uh, it really amazes me is that it comes naturally. He's not doing it for a gains to an end, you know, a means to right. an end.
when he picked up the guitar and you told me it was, I'm not saying that a light shone down on Edward and he walked on water, but I mean, there's some true artistry that goes on when he holds his instrument, you know? Well, I definitely think that he's gifted. Just as some people are gifted at, uh, at running or doing sports, or some people gifted playing pool, or some people uh, gifted at being uh, in the money business, such as accountants and attorneys, etc. Ed is definitely gifted in music, and he uh, he loves it. He loves playing music. Uh, it's really funny because, not funny, but a lot of people uh, look at Ed and they idolize him, and they want to play like him, and they want to dress like him, and uh, i got to be honest about this. If Ed had the, the ego trip that Roth has, he'd be sitting there parading around and going, yeah, this is the way it should be. Ed's not like that at all. He wants to play fucking music. And if it influences someone and help them play, then fine. I mean, he's the, Ed is the most shy person I know. When somebody says, hey, you're great, Ed goes, oh, yeah, thanks, okay. But he does need reassurance, though. No. No? No. He just doesn't like, um, I guess the best way to put it, he just doesn't like the phony bullshit. He said something once to me that was amazing. He said that he feels guilty because of all the recognition, the spotlight and stuff, and all that stuff, and being recognized, that he wanted no part of. He feels guilty because it came to him, and he thinks that it should have gone all these other guys who really wanted it, you know? That's the way it is. He's always been like that. Mm -hmm. He never did it for for ego reasons, for uh, stature, you know what I mean? You've always got a pecking order, so to speak. You know, somebody always wants to be the top guy, or I want to be the president, or I want to be the big chief honcho, I want to be so-and-so. It's not like that. He just he flows, and they, that's what shows. Is he like that, basically? Was he like that in school and his interactions with people? In school, Ed was pretty lousy. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ed was, Ed was a, uh, an average student. He wasn't ex uh, extremely, uh, well, let's say, above the rest. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you were. You, did, you got the grades, didn't you? Uh, up to a certain point when I wanted, I wanted to. See, we come from a very driving family, especially my mother. She wants her sons to be the best they possibly can be. And for a while, I believed that. But when I started to dig into my own life and my own enjoyment of life, I started saying, forget it. In, in what ways? In what ways? Well, uh, I know a lot of people who sit there and just for the very sake of beating somebody or being smarter than somebody or outdoing somebody, you know, particularly in sports, that they sit there and they work their ass off to do it. Now what's the sense? Okay, you beat the motherfucker and then what? It's like you watch tennis, right? What is the main goal that Yvonne Lendl has? And what is the main goal that John McEnroe has? They just play. They both made over a fucking million dollars. Jesus Christ. What's the, uh, what are you working for? What is it? Do you love the game tennis? And that's the difference between Ed and everybody else. Everybody else is using that particular talent and capability to get somewhere. For Ed, it's just playing the instrument. I'm the one who's always telling him, Jesus Christ, don't be so doggone stupid. You know, he sits there and he does things with uh, Brian May, didn't make a cent of it. He says, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. He I was happy doing it. He didn't make any And I said, oh, okay. He may have made some. I, uh, maybe I'm he used does. to it. Yeah. You were angry about the uh, Michael Jackson. Oh, definitely. Yeah. He didn't make one cent, did he? As far as I know, not. I think that's probably a question you should ask Ed. Yeah. I just think that the people like Ed are very few and far between. Ed is just pure music. Ed couldn't care less if he lived in a, in a shack. Just give him a guitar, and that would make him happy. And I'm serious. Yeah. I know it sounds hokey. I know it sounds corny. I know you probably don't believe it. No, I do. But that's the fucking yeah. truth. That's the way Ed is. He's, you know, I just hope to make him at least financially comfortable so that when he's a kid, he can afford a baseball or something.
what is it about Ed and his circle of friends? Um, like he does, it's not like he's got, you know, 20 people calling every day who are his close buddies, and you know he doesn't go to hang out. And well, how many buddies do you have? That's true. One or two. Close friends. But my only buddy is uh, my parents, Ed, my wife. Callie-Ann, Greg Emerson. No, there are a few other friends, but really not buddies. Yeah. Steve, you probably know Ed, but from a different angle than I do. Because I've known him for all my life. And I haven't really stopped and thought about all this stuff. But everything you said is true. Ed doesn't care. He doesn't care for the, the so-called quote-unquote uh, glamour, for the so-called quote-unquote uh, superstar and the rest of the crap. Is when Ed has a friend, that friend is there forever. He doesn't, he doesn't fuck around. He's so amazing. I just, you know. Yeah, he's, a, mean, he's really, a great guy. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about um, your parents? A little bit maybe about how they met? They seem to be come from two different worlds. Two different, yeah, they did. You know, I, mean, I know your dad worlds. much better than, than your mother, but, uh, you know. Well, my dad is a. Uh, I guess you would call it devil may care, whatever that expression is. <laughs> he goes out and he does it. <laughs> he fucks around and does everything you can imagine. He was born in um, Den Helder. The D N H E L D. There you go. <laughs> yeah, D N H E L D E R. Which is where? That's uh, the northern part of uh, of Holland. Okay. It's up in the North Sea. And your dad was born where? He was born in uh, 1920, okay. January 18th, 1920. And my mom was born in, uh, in Jakarta, and it was in uh, 1914, uh, September 21st. And my dad has always just been a carouser. You know, he got caught up in the old war action, whatever. I guess that tends to change people's uh, minds about certain things. And uh, after the war, he went to Indonesia to play on the radio, and he did about five shows a day, and he ran into my mother. My mother hated his guts. <laughs> she couldn't stand him. <laughs> she said she didn't like him because he didn't wear any underwear. <laughs> well, eventually the two of them got together, and uh, Sakana took over the country and kicked all the whiteys out. So my mom and my dad left and lived in Holland for a while. They were they were married in yeah. uh, Jakarta. I think so. That's a funny question. You know, I don't even know that. I don't know whether they're married. And what was your dad like as a kid? What what did he do? I mean, was he was he playing music when he was when he was young? And he was like I don't know exactly what my dad was like, but if, if uh, the way he behaves now is any uh, indication of the way he used to be, then I would say that he was definitely a, a, a devil raiser. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. he, he just he enjoys life. Let's put it that way. So he, jo he joined the, uh, the Dutch Air Force? That was after my parents came back. After they were married, and they came back to Holland because Sukarno kicked them out, right. and then he joined the Air Force. I see. What did your mom do in Jakarta? Uh, she was a secretary. Yeah. I can show you some pictures. Well, she was a piece of ass. Yeah, yeah. She was, she was a good looking woman. Hmm. She still is, you know, for 74. Is she? She's great. Uh, your mom, I uh, thought your dad, uh, Nazis or something, was going to send them to a camp or something because you played music? Well, both my parents spent time in camp. They did? They yeah. were in camps? Where? where in, in Germany? No, my mom in uh, somewhere in Indonesia and my dad somewhere in Germany. Really? But my dad is such a finagler, man. He got out of it. He just... He said, I make music for you. Okay. Now, he's, he's quite a character. I learned a lot from him. He's got the best sense of humor. Everything to him is just funny. You know, you sit there and kind of looks at it and absorbs it. I mean, your dad just, you know, from singing with some of the shows and stuff, seems to, I mean, really, I mean, love, you know, what you guys do. Your mom still seems like, you know, why don't you, I mean, uh, you know, why don't you go ahead and get a job or something or what? Yeah, well, she's still like that. I think my mom is a very uh, uh, goal-oriented person. You know, she wants the kids to be, uh, respected and be the normal line of life, so to speak. To be an accountant, or an attorney, or a doctor, 
or any of those things. And uh, he came as, I think, a bit of a shock. <laughs> what, what did she want you to be? Did she have something she in mind for you? Oh, hell. When I was a kid, I used to go, I went through uh, computer technician school. I went through computer assembly and reassembly and the whole bullshit. Wow. I went through a number of different courses. Yeah, and they were all way above my head. I mean, I was only, what, nine years old. She shouldn't have given me college <laughs> courses. She's a very driving woman. And I'll tell you, she was, uh, and she still is, a driving woman. She just wants to, uh, to see the kids uh, doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. What did she see, Edward? Did uh, she have any aspirations for him? Not that I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> you, no, not that I can remember. Really? Do you know anything about their parents? Well, my mother came from a very wealthy family in Indonesia. Really? And my father came from uh, a working class uh, Dutch family. Right. His father was a butcher. They're from Norwegian descent. So maybe his parents look at him playing music the same way. Maybe they. You know, I, it's, it's hard to describe because my father has a sense of humor. I wish that someday I will attain. He really does. He can make fun out of anything that you ever see, and he's fun to be with. He says the humor just is completely different than anybody else. I'm not talking about the joke. You can uh, you can get a hold of me on my uh, Instagram page anytime. Steve dot Rosen dot guitar dot picks. Uh, or you can check me out on Facebook. I think if you type in Steve Rosen Tone Chaser, you'll find me there. Um, so okay, bye.